I love that over a dialect. Oya Chuku Gozri. Mano Porangwe Hogi me. The Otla. Just a little segue there. Hello, everybody. Once again, this is Fred Wankwa coming to you from our studios in Chicago with another edition of Bold Talk on Allen TV. As usual, I like to say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you, depending on where you are around the world. Today is going to be a potpourri of my own discussion and quite a few sound bites from different reliable sources all talking about or most of them talking about the disgrace that Nigeria's judiciary has become and you're gonna see different graphics that are scroll along in certain segments you'll be hearing the voice but no image of me or whoever is talking but you'll be seeing related graphics just to give you a visual of what Nigeria is headed for under this devil may care administration and a devil may care judiciary that's emerging in a grocery, grossly corrupt Nigeria. Sit back and enjoy this. It's not, it's not gonna be 15 or 17 minutes. It may be up to 30 minutes, but it's gonna be a solid 30 minutes that I'm appealing to you ahead of time to like, subscribe, and share. Let's make this go viral. Well, yesterday I was reminding everybody that the judges are not from Singapore. The judges in the tribunal are not from Singapore. Mm. And they didn't fall from heaven. They are Nigerians, sure. as corrupt as all of us, <laughs> so that we'll be realistic in our expectations. Mm, mm. If corruption has overtaken community to the degree that the justice system is corrupt, the police is corrupt, everyone is corrupt, the ministers are corrupt, everything is corrupt, if that happens it, to any country, any nation, then those who are upright, their survival is at risk. The reason is when they come up to say, guys, don't do this, it's wrong. The police will attack them. The judges will judge against them. The, the ministers will be against them. The entire nation will be fighting them because they've been making their money in the wrong way. They've been into bribery. You know, you could bribe perhaps in some countries the justice system. The I mean, listen to the guy. The only thing I disagree with him is that he said perhaps. No, there is no perhaps. In Nigeria, it's perfectly what he described. The ministers are corrupt, the judges are corrupt, the kingpin drug lord that they are supporting because he bribed them is corrupt, and on and on and on. And then to make things worse, we keep looking to America, we keep looking to France, we keep looking to Britain. Now we are looking to China and to Russia, and we are even starting to bring in India. Nobody is going to help Nigeria. And let me tell you why nobody is going to help Nigeria. Because it's in the best interest of all these people we keep looking to. It's in their best interest not to help us. The less they help us, the more they can steal from us without lifting a hand. Because it's our people that they bribe, like Bola Ahmed Tinubu and the one in Ivory Coast, and the one who just left Gabon, and the one who just left Niger, and the one who just left Chad, you know where I'm going with this. 
we need to do it for ourselves. But listen to this uh, soundbite from Zambia at a discussion where you had an international community. Just listen. Led by the United States. They have come to Southern Africa to teach us democracy. A country that was opposed to our liberation, a country that supported colonial regimes, the apartheid regime in South Africa, the white racist minority regime in Zimbabwe, now Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, the Portuguese colonial governments in Mozambique, in Angola, in Guinea-Bissau, and Cape Verde. Today is coming to Africa to teach us about democracy. A country that has toppled so many governments in Africa, that has led so many coups in Africa and other parts of the world, a country that has killed so many of our leaders in Africa and other parts of the world, the killers of Patis Rumumba, those who top toppled Kwame Nkrumah, those who killed Nasser, those who killed Muammar Gaddafi, today are coming to teach us about democracy. A country that has been built on a brutal force, on enslavement of other human beings, on the humiliation of Africans, the exploitation of Africans, the plunder of Africa, today is coming to teach us about democracy. Folks, that's a very challenging one for me. <clears throat> As you know, I live in the United States. I'll be lying if I say I don't like the United States. <clears throat> I'll be lying if I say the United States, for the most part, has not been good to me or good to many Africans who live here. But also, United States is a country where people are free, at least on paper and for the most part in practice. People are free to make choices the best way that it benefits them as long as it's legal and they are not stepping on anybody else's legal rights. For us Africans in America, we really need to take a step back and reevaluate our relationship with African Americans our African-American brothers and sisters. Our struggle is no longer an African struggle. My struggle is no longer a Nigeria struggle. And for the most part, Americans in general, but African-Americans in particular, don't quite understand what our struggle is especially because many of them feel like who gives a damn about your struggle you people sold our forefathers into slavery and look at the humiliation we've gone through in america and i think it's time to make start making formal overtures to the african-american leadership and community to make them understand that even us Africans regret what our forefathers did to their forefathers and then trying to appeal to them that it's time for us to come together and heal together because regardless of what happens until we heal together and then focus on regaining our strengths in Africa, starting with regaining the control of our resources in Africa. Regardless of what we do here in America, 
we are not going to maximize what we want to do because as long as Africa is a shameful continent, America is not going to respect us as black people because we have no place to go. And why am I saying Why that? do I say we have no place to go? We have no place to go because we don't have what it takes to beat our brutal, corrupt leaders at home because they've stolen all the money and they can use it to buy up everybody that could help beat them, especially the police and the judiciary. And that leaves us with the fact that if we can beat them, we can beat their puppeteers who are the ones in America and a European Union and France that bribe them with our resources and have them control everything while they abuse us. So what do we do in that case? We need to collaborate effectively with our African-American brothers and sisters who have roots here and have built political clout because they have votes, block votes. We need to go now and collaborate with them and join our votes with them, however, with them trusting us that we are now fully ready to work with them as brothers and sisters, then we need to educate them about the corruption back home. When they get to understand the corruption back home and the force that home can be if we replace the corrupt leaders and how it gives them an opportunity to be able to join us at home and thrive on their own because they are part of us. When we're able to convince them on those critical relationships that need to be built, then we and them can now have the clout to go to Washington, to go to our village halls and our governor's mansions in our states where we are and now lobby them for what we want and all we want are policies that will stop exploiting us not at their expense we're not saying they can't get our resources we're saying we want to be able to now work on the terms that creates a win-win situation for America and for Africa. And part of what creates a win-win situation is that they must stop encouraging corruption in Africa and they must stop supporting puppets that work for them instead of working for Africa. And they must stop supporting puppets who install corrupt judiciaries that don't give us an opportunity to have fair elections. All these things work hand in hand, guys. But the elementary part of this is that we need to change the mindset of our own leaders here in America at all, the, at all these mushroom organizations we have that is just organizations where we organize parties and wakekeepings and nothing tangible and nothing meaningful to better our lives in America or our people's lives in Africa. It's time for Africans to wake up at home and in America and every place else in diaspora. And why am I saying that? Because Bola Ahmed Tinubu has locked in a lot of 
significant African-American voices, especially in Chicago, with his money. I know that. And I'm not blaming the African-Americans he locked in because for them, he's making campaign contributions to them. But it's time for us to start showing where these campaign contributions are coming from and who is hurting at the expense of those bribes he's giving them, bribes as campaign contributions. We need to bring to their attention Bola Ahmed Tinubu's drug involvement as a kingpin in America and how that would have affected their children who were buying those drugs. We need to bring to their attention Bola Ahmed, Ahmed Tinubu's forgeries, be it at Southwest Community College that became Daily College or whatever, be it at Chicago State University, we need to tell them about those forgeries. We need to tell America about his lies, about his employment at Deloitte. Deloitte has said that this man did not work for them. Maybe as a janitor that they don't care about, but not as an accountant. A major one for that matter that claimed he got a bonus to the tune of millions of dollars for the work he did for Deloitte. How can a man who has no knowledge of how to get admission, pass exams, everything he did was forgery, where did he get the acumen to work at Deloitte? The only thing Bola Ahmed Tinubu has done in his life successfully is lie, forge, cheat, bribe, and hire thugs to get what he wants. We have to paint the picture of a man, not forge, not fake. We need to paint the real picture of this man to America. Jimmy, go ahead. Thanks, thanks a lot, George. Um, I've been a regular um, viewer of your show for many years. Um, I just wanted to say... Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to say, with regards to Nigeria, we need to be quite careful about it. Because, yeah, indeed, there is, uh, there's been, there were some discrepancies with, in the last election, but it's not enough to say who won or who did not win. I would just like to say... Um, um, opposition to the current president has led to a lot of spike of violence against his ethnic group, the Yoruba people. And this is where we need to be careful um, as to how people frame the, re the, um, the problems they have with the president. Because at the moment, if care is not taken, the way um, a lot of independent journalists, so to say, are framing these things up, it might lead to another brutal um, ethnic clash. And um, as you know, my country experienced the civil war in um, 1967 between the then breakaway Biafra region and the rest of the country. I'm afraid we might be heading in that direction again. So I would like you to please take a step back and actually review um, the dynamics to the last election. Because it's, we can't say for sure that Peter will be won that election. A lot of, yeah, we do vote on the basis of religion and ethnicity, but most Nigerians are Muslims and we voted for Bola Ahmed Tinubu. Whatever problems people have with him is fair, but is the person most of us voted for. And um, I think the more people are going after him on a personal level as against going for INEC, which is the body responsible for elections, um, civilians from my ethnic group are being targeted. And um, I just called the, 
because I've seen um, a lot of um, conversations surrounding him, and I want you to be aware of the risk he poses on the ground. Thank you. <laughs> All I can do is shake my head. You guys have heard that Nazri, Nazri rhyme, liar, liar, pens on fire. I am still waiting to get the reports of where Yoruba people are being vandalized and brutalized in Nigeria as a result of the last election. And um, let me add sarcastically that Igbos, Igbos just walked around Lagos scotch-free. No Yoruba person was attacking Igbos. Igbos were going from house to house attacking Yoruba people. That's how much lie this idiot just told, <laughs> calling in and making a fool of himself. I guess you could say that he studied the school of Dele Alake and Bayo Nonuga School of Journalism. The journalism they practiced in Nigeria before social media was present, where they distort news about everything going on in Nigeria and just put it on their newspapers and us gullible Nigerians who are buying it and reading it. Unfortunately, social media is here today and a lot of social media like the Galloway show he called into and my show, I must say, are very reputable social media sources. We report the facts vehemently, factually. We never twist the story, but we tell those stories people are scared to tell in a corrupt, brutal country where they are scared about what the thugs can do to them. And I just thought I'll add that little addendum before I give you Galloway's response to the idiot. Well, look, uh, I, 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 there's no question of me taking a step back. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm merely hosting uh, a show in which all kinds of people are invited. Every five minutes, I invite everyone to call the show. Uh, to give their point of view, and you just have uh, very succinctly indeed. Uh, you have uh, taught me something. I had absolutely no idea uh, that Tinubu was from the Yoruba people. That's the only good thing about him. And my uh, contempt for him has zero to do with the fact that he's a Muslim, and zero to do with the fact that he comes from the Yoruba people. Uh, these two things are the only two good things about him. I'm against him because he's a crook. I'm against him because he's a thief. I'm against him because he's a bag man for the bigger thieves. In Chicago, Illinois, I'm against him because he forged his election papers. I'm against him because I neck forged his victory in the election. Am I supposed to turn a blind eye to all these things? Uh, because he's a Muslim, because he's a Yoruba, because this may uh, lead to ill feeling uh, to his uh, people. When I express my contempt for Rishi Sunak, I'm not hating on Indian Hindus. I'm hating on Rishi Sunak for everything except the fact that he's an Indian Hindu. I part that. I have no interest in that. I'm against Sunak for a whole range of other reasons. I'm against Tinubu for a whole range of other issues. Now, I invite all points of view to enter this debate over Nigeria. If we had a Moats Africa, we could do it exclusively every week on, uh, on that show tailor-made for the African uh, audience. But we don't have that, so we can't talk about Nigeria every single week, every single show. Uh, but 
we had David on in advance of the court decision. We've now had him on after the court decision, which I followed closely and which was every bit as farcical as David Hundian described it. What are we supposed to do? Not do so? Accept that the greatest African country is run by a crook? A forger? No, I will never accept that. I have too much respect for all the peoples of Nigeria. What a great question. What am I supposed to do? Accept that the greatest African country is run by a crook. I like when these things are said by other people other than me. And I say that because this guy just laid out my argument. And this time I'm concluding by taking a few minutes to talk to one, Yoruba people, two, other Nigerians, especially Igbos, who call me or message me and say that I should stop living this pipe dream about progressive Yorubas, that nothing like that exists. And I started out that way to make a point. It hurts me as somebody who has a genuine love for Yoruba people, just like I have developed a genuine love for the United States people, and just like I have a genuine love for Cameroon people, and I'll tell you why those three people. I was born in Cameroon. And because of that, I have an affinity for my place of birth. I moved to Lagos when I was five years old. And from 1960, 61 to 1966, when we left Lagos for the Biafra War, moved back east, 90% of my friendships were Yorubas. It couldn't be anything else. And at the end of the Civil War, 90% of my time in Nigeria, until I left Nigeria in 1978, was in Lagos. I finished high school in Lagos. I started high school in Enugu. I developed a genuine friendship with my Yoruba friends that I hold on to until this day. Just like the friendships I have with my fellow Igbos, but I don't separate the two. And you've heard me completely destroy bigoted, corrupt Igbos, greedy, selfish, cabal-pocketed Igbos. But when I say the same thing about Bola Ahmed Tinubu, who is the biggest crook that ever lived on the continent of Africa, I'm talking about Bola Ahmed Tinubu for God's sake. I'm not talking about Yoruba people. Bola Ahmed Tinubu is not Yoruba people. And any Yoruba people who now thinks that Bola Ahmed Tinubu is synonymous with Yorubaness should be ashamed of himself because it's a disgrace to the legacy of Obafemi Awolowo. It's a disgrace to the legacy of Pade Sonia and the living legacy of pa, pa Adebanjo and all the great Yoruba people that have lived. If this come, this scum, cheating, forging, bribing, thuggery inducing human being is the role model you want to put forward as the picture of Yorubaders. You should be ashamed of yourself as a Yoruba person. 
bringing me back to progressive Yorubas. And any Igbo person that doesn't think there are progressive Yorubas is a very selective reader or selective listener or selective viewer of events that concern Nigeria. Because it's those same Igbos that will share with me things that Padeban just said or wrote in defense of Peter Obi. And they, they pump their chests out. They are happy about that. Yet they don't know there are progressive or liberal or moderate Yorubas. It's the same Igbos that will be very proud of what the youth of Yoruba land are doing as major contributing members of the obedient movement. They share those things that the obedient Yorubas are doing, but they don't believe you can trust Yorubas. What makes you think you can trust Igbos more than you can trust Yorubas? As an Igbo person, you've been let down more by an Igbo person than a Yoruba person. And the same thing goes to Yoruba bigots that make every problem they have Igbos. You've been messed up more in your life by your fellow Yoruba people than an Igbo person. I just wish people would let me do my work. Enjoy it if you like it. Delete it if you don't. And for those of you who really like what I'm doing, I know it's not your style, I know it's not your culture, but I'm pleading with you. I wanna go viral with some of these things. I want you to like, I want you to share, and I want you to subscribe. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, this is Fred Wonko coming to you from our studios in Chicago with another edition of Bull Talk on Allen TV. And until next time, good night and God bless. Publisher African Lifestyle Magazine Chicago One for the Chicago Jemba I can have one on my game Lala Terry Wanko Wanko Yachadia Jewel Coro 